people um, to turn off, to put themselves on mute once it starts. We're going to do that. We're going to okay. mute everyone. Right. Thank you. I Sorry. Think it's probably a good time for us. Starting off, just why don't they play bad news? Okay. Okay. All right. I want to make a guess if I do, because I want to make you a. To mute. I think we're ready to mute everyone except for <laughs> David and Lane. No, you need to get in this lane. Oh, oh you're still driving? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I because you're going to get sucked else. into going down and then back out. I didn't Okay, I'm unmuted, right? Okay. Penny unmuted also, and then we'll start. Okay, I think we're, we're all set to go. So thank you all for your patience. I hope you enjoyed all of the little technical things that we've been going through. I wanna quickly thank, before we get started, Yvette, who's in one of your boxes. Yvette works in our office and she has been, and has been in charge of the Zoom part of this event, which is uh, not a small thing. So thank you, Yvette. Um, we're delighted to have you all with us this evening. There are at present 79 of you, and I have to say that you have participated in making a record number of attendees for an author event. So uh, this, is, this is a wonderful uh, thing to be able to tell you all. And I wanna mention, my name is Penny Wright. I'm in charge of adult programs at the library and there are lots of people to thank. I wanna shout out to, um, uh, to Elaine's two daughters, Gabriella and Alex, who are here somewhere, and you may see them in your screens. We're so delighted that um, they, can't, they can't be with their mom, but they're here with us. And so that's a little bit of a visit. And we're happy about that. Um, this started with David Alpern, who you may be able to see on your screens. David Alpern, who is a friend and who who hosts our Coffee and Conversation series at the library and does other programming for us, um, told me uh, some time ago about a wonderful woman, friend, colleague, former colleague who had just written a, a terrific book about the Sen, and that was Elaine. So um, David Alpern was, a, some of you know him, he was a longtime senior editor and reporter at Newsweek magazine. He then had a long running radio interview show called Four Year Ears Only. And he um, has been a very good friend to this library. And uh, 
we have asked him to, to introduce Elaine, with whom he has a history. So we'll go ahead and get started and ask you, David, if you could say a few words about our guest tonight. I will indeed. Thank you, Penny. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker from Paris, my beautiful friend, Elaine Cholino, contributing writer for the New York Times, previously the paper's UN bureau chief, Paris bureau chief, CIA and terrorism correspondent, and first ever female chief diplomatic correspondent. Uh, Elaine began in makeup and production at Newsweek, then became a researcher, a reporter, correspondent in Chicago, then Paris, bureau chief in Rome, and roving correspondent overseas. It was from Paris with prescience, you might say, uh, that she proposed going to interview a Muslim cleric who sat under an apple tree in a sleepy town 25 miles away, praying and preaching and passing out cassettes. They say if there's ever a revolution in Iran, he will be the heart of it, she cabled, and she got an editor's okay. She went, she wrote, and several months later, she was invited to fly on the jetliner with that cleric, Ayatollah Khomeini, back to Tehran and the 1979 revolution that he had indeed fomented. Her reporting in Iran then and over the next two decades led to her second best-selling book, Persian Mirrors, The Elusive Face of Iran, in, 20, in 2000 and updated in 2005. Her first book, The Outlaw State, Saddam Hussein's Quest for Power and the Gulf Crisis, was a 1991 Book of the Month Club selection. Her next, La Seduction, How the French Play the Game of Life, was among the Times Best Books of 2011. It also made Elaine the perfect guest on our Newsweek radio show when a sex scandal that year forced the resignation of International Monetary Fund Director Dominique Strauss-Kahn, a top French left politician already known as Le Grand Seducteur. In 2001, from the U.S. Secretary of State's Open Forum Program, Elaine received the Distinguished Public Service Award for Outstanding Contributions to International Affairs and the Excellence in Journalism Award in recognition of outstanding contributions to international affairs reporting and commentary. In 2010, Elaine was decorated Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, the highest award of the French state, for her special contribution to France-U.S. friendship. In 2015 came another bestseller, The Only Street in Paris, Life on the Rue des Martyrs. Uh, the Wall Street Journal called it a sublime stroll through that street's rich history and stories of those there now. Elaine takes the same tack in her latest book, The Seine, The River That Made Paris, both a travelogue and a cultural history, not only of the river from its source northwest of Dijon through towns big and small to the English Channel at La Havre, but also of the people who have lived, worked, or been inspired by it, from Monet, uh, Matisse, Flaubert, and Hemingway to musicians and filmmakers today. She and her husband, the lawyer Andrew Plump, have lived in Paris since 2002. They have two daughters, Alessandra and Gabriella, with us tonight. As of last year, when Elaine spoke at the Dutch Creek Club in Manhattan, she was the only American member of Femme Forum, a Paris-based private club of 200 leading women in France. And maintenant, Elaine, encore à vous. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, is there any, it, it, wow. <laughs> um, what David uh, hasn't told you, and thank you so much, David, for, uh, for friendship, for um, collegiality, and for being my editor on a Friday afternoon, uh, New York time, it was Friday night Paris time when the news, news magazine was just about ready to close. And I call in from Paris and say, I just got an exclusive interview with um, this Muslim cleric, Ayatollah Khomeini, and um, uh, you know, out in Nifle Le Chateau, and I'm the first American and the first woman to ever interview him. And and David was on the line because he was filling in for the foreign editor. He usually did was the big American politics guru and and the national uh, affairs um, uh, editor and and writer. But he was filling in in foreign that week, and he said, Elaine, there's no space in the magazine. It's clo you know we've closed the section. And I said, David, I think this guy is going to be important. And David, with that, trusted me and took it to the editors. And he said, we're going to have to rip open some space in the magazine for this interview with this, this, this obscure cleric sitting under the apple tree. So I owe a lot to, to, to David Alpert, and I'm still paying back with interest. Which I will <laughs> so 
Um, Elaine, would we, before we get started with your, some, a little bit of a travelogue, could you just begin by, you know, talking about your history with Paris from childhood, from teenage years, et cetera, just so that we know why you uh, came to love this city? Okay, well, first I have to go back a little. First I have to say, I, 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 I was so excited about take, talking about David Alpern and Ayatollah Khomeini that I forgot to say hello to Alessandra and Gabriella. Thank you so much, my dear daughters, for being there. And I was supposed to be there in person tonight, but um, next summer, uh, uh, you know, next, next year in Southampton. Um, and before I talk about Paris, I just have to talk about the Hamptons a little because I love the Hamptons. Um, uh, one Saturday morning, uh, I um, in 1984, I was sitting on the Long Island Railroad going to friends in Sagaponic, and this man sat down next to me, and we will have been married 35 years uh, in September. And I even I was thinking, do I have a Southampton connection? And I have Southampton Hospital is where we took Alessandra when she had a tick in her ear, and Southampton Hospital is where we found out that I was pregnant with Gabriella. So both daughters have connections to Southampton, oh, Southampton Hospital. Um, Paris, why, why Paris? I mean, Paris is always a good idea. It's sort of a paraphrase of what Audrey Hepburn said um, in Sabrina, but um, Paris delivers. I mean, the thing about Paris is um, we know Paris in our imagination before we even come here. We read about Paris in Hemingway. We read about Paris in, uh, the Three Musketeers, and uh, we we fall in love with the idea of Paris, the idea that we can come here and sit at a cafe and slow down life and have the perfect croissant and cafe creme, and that something wonderful will happen if we just linger long enough. I mean, even Hemingway, who um, suffered from terrible bouts of depression, uh, loved Paris and particularly loved the Seine, and and, and once wrote in a movable feast, I can never be lonely along the, the river. Uh, I came to Paris thinking we were gonna be here for three to five years. Uh, we've been here for 18 years now and um, we still we still love it. And uh, if David, if you wanna bring, you know, your coffee clatch to Paris, we can do, um, we can do a book club kind of thing in my living room uh, next, next year. <laughs> You, you talk in the beginning of, of your book about some of the French ways that you have become used to or that took some getting used to. Can you just talk a little bit about that, about some of the things you encountered that were quite different from your ordinary experiences with dealing with some Some Americans think that Parisians are rude and it, it used to be that much more that way than now, because with the internet and and American culture having invaded um, France, there there really is a a, a love of um, things American. I won't say of the United States necessarily, but things American and American culture, and um, many more people speak English. But you sort of have to learn the codes, and you know one of the codes that I certainly didn't know the first time I came to Paris which sounds so trite, is that you're supposed to say bonjour to just about everybody. You, you walk into an elevator or onto a bus, you're supposed to say bonjour. You walk into a cheese store and we would just sort of stand in the corner, you're not gonna get served or you won't get served well unless you say bonjour. Um, uh, you know, there are certain ways of dressing um, in, uh, in Paris where you um, uh, was not, would you would not um, uh, uh, in the old days you would not dare to wear um, sweatpants on the Rue du Bac, my fancy old neighborhood. But now all the codes have been upended because um, the the in shoe this year in in Paris are are, are Birkenstocks, uh, so that um, the the pandemic has transformed the way Parisians are dressing. But you also mentioned things not to do, like maybe eye contact or be overly friendly, right? Oh, well, eye can't contact is fine. I mean, you, the le, le regard, looking at the other, and you know all those, remember all those Eric Romer movies that go on, go on forever and ever, and there's no dialogue, just sort of staring at each other for, for what seems like hours on end. So eye, eye contact is good. Smiling is 
<clears throat> not great. You, you never just sort of give away the smile to a stranger on the street or even to you know, a mother and a child on a metro, if you smiled at them, she would look at you and say, why is this person smiling at me? Uh, it's, it's very interesting to, to ha have to <clears throat> maneuver in this world, but it's all changing now. I mean, for example, something like um, uh, the kiss, you know, the use of the double cheeked kiss, which is universal. I mean, my kids hated it when they were growing up in Paris. And, you, you know, if, if they were, um, with a whole group of, of older people, of adults, uh, they would have to be endure the kisses of every single person um, uh, in, in the room. Well, with the pandemic, nobody is doing um, cheek kissing anymore. And, uh, and it's still, it's a great story actually, the, the end of the cheek, uh, the end of the besma, uh, the end of the, the end of the bees, the end of the, uh, the cheek, the cheek kiss, the besma is something else. It's the, it's the hand kiss, um, uh, which is also going out of style. Well, you seem like a pretty friendly person, but the not smiling part must have been a little bit shocking for you. I mean, you know, or do you do you say this is who I am? I'm just going to smile, or do I, I I have decided, you know, you can you can make decisions coming to to France. A lot of foreigners come here and they try to be French. I decide, you know, I'm going to stay American. Um, and I'm, I'm also, I have a double thing because I'm not just American, but I'm a, I'm of a hundred percent Sicilian descent. So that makes me a product of immigration, which puts me in a whole different category. But my feeling is this defines who I am. And so I can break all the codes and I can be forgiven because this outsider, this foreigner just doesn't know any better. Just, you know, you mentioned in the chapter about when you took the river cruise to the, you know, the Havre and the other, and you were alone, you didn't take this trip with your husband and you were sitting amongst, you know, Australians and Canadians. And when you mentioned that you wrote for the New York Times, uh, there was, di you know, disappointment or disapproval. Um, and actually somebody got up and left the table well, uh, it was there was yes, absolutely. It was disapproval by the Ameri by the Americans. There were uh, basically um, uh, right most of them were yeah different uh, different nationalities, but mostly it was an Anglophone group. And I decided to take um, to take this tour because I wanted to see the Seine through. Well, first of all, from the viewpoint of the river itself, but all through also through the prism of of um, Americans who perhaps had never traveled on this river. And so most of the passengers were American. And yes, um, it happened to be that, uh, that every single person, every single American, except one couple who just kept quiet, um, they were all Trump supporters. And when they heard that I worked for the New York Times, uh, I did, did not wanna uh, talk to me. So I hung out with the Australians and the Canadians. Mm -hmm. Elaine, um, so back to the, the issue at hand here, the sin. Can you talk a little bit about what, ins what inspired you to write that particular book? This book? I, I, was, I was searching for uh, a topic after I had done my last book on one street in Paris, that is the Rue des Martyrs, which is my shopping street just at the corner of our street. And it's, it's half a mile of magic. It's bottom part is zoned artisanal. So that means that all of these wonderful food shops um, coexist and interact. And you really, I, and I, it made me happy. I, I wrote in that book, I can never be sad on the Rue des Martyrs. And a friend of mine, when I was looking for a book top, topic said, what made you happy when you first came to Paris? And I thought about it and I thought, what gave me both comfort and joy was the Seine because I arrived in Paris. I was still in my twenties. Um, I had been married and my husband came home one day and said he didn't want to be married anymore. And, and uh, you know, I divided up all the furniture and gave him the BMW, he even took the stereo system. And four months later he was married again. And I went off to Paris to, uh, become a foreign correspondent. Uh, and uh, I had no sources, no lovers, no friends, very bad French, but I had the Seine and every day I would walk home 
over my one favorite bridge and I'd stand in the middle of the bridge and I'd say, you know what, it's going to be okay. And, you know, eventually it was. Mm -hmm. Elaine, would this be a point at which you could give us a little bit of a travelogue by looking at your... Um... Yes, yes. We're going to do a little show and tell here. And um, uh, so I'm going to take you quickly through a slideshow if it works. So let's see, can I, can I click on? Yes? Yvette, are you there? I am, yes, you should be able to click on. Okay, I've just clicked. Does it click, does it work? I think if you hit slideshow. Oh, that would be good, slideshow, let's see. And then uh, start from the beginning all the way on the far left, it says from the beginning and I think. Good, thank you, okay. How's that? Super. And, yes. Do we see it? Yes? Yes. yes? yes. Okay. This is the Seine River, right? It's, it, it should only be 250 miles, but because of all the curves, it's about almost 500. And, and, you know, those of you who know the Seine from just Paris, think of it as a pretty straight river. It's really not. Uh, it goes all the way from a very, very, um, this, you know, mundane, obscure plain in, um, in, uh, in deep Burgundy. I mean, this is where there are more cows than people all the way to Le Havre to the sea. And then this is the source of the Seine, uh, it, which is in deep Burgundy. And if you look here, it says Ville de Paris, city of Paris. Why? You know, this, is, this, this place is probably 170 some miles away from Paris. It says Ville de Paris because Napoleon III decided that he wanted this, the source of the Seine to be part of Paris. So he sent Baron Ausmann, his um, prefect of the Seine who rebuilt um, Paris in the 19th century to this site. Uh, they marked it all off, they bought some land and they declared it Paris. So it's kind of like, you know, those of you who know there are 20 arrondissements in Paris, it's kind of like Paris's 21st arrondissement. So the source of the Seine belongs to Paris. Here is the first bridge over the Seine. And I love this picture because my husband took this picture because it shows you just how tiny the Seine is at its beginning. Um, uh, very different from the bridges uh, we'll see later with the, um, when they wake, they come uh, over the Seine in Paris. And here is a rendering, an artist rendering of a Gallo-Roman healing temple at the source of the Seine. This was a sacred river and there was a healing goddess named Sequana who would, would heal pilgrims who came from as far as the Mediterranean and what is now the English Channel and would drop offerings made of stone or wood or, or metal into that uh, thing that kind of looks like a swimming pool there. And here is the goddess Sequana. Um, this is a statue in the Gallo uh, Roman uh, Museum in Dijon. My daughter took this, Gabriella took this photograph and I fell so in love with this absolutely gorgeous statue that I entered a contest to called Reinvent the Seine to, to and, I, and I put together a whole package to try to build a statue of her uh, along the Seine, either in Paris, Rouen and La Havre. And you're gonna have to read the book to see if I won or lost. <laughs> and there she, there she is again. Isn't she gorgeous? I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't, isn't she beautiful? Wouldn't you like to see a statue of her someplace? And then we have the Statue of Liberty in the Seine. I mean, for heaven's sakes, why do we have the Statue of Liberty next to the Eiffel Tower, but not Sequana, right? I mean, isn't the Statue of Liberty look awfully lonely out there all by herself? I mean, we would, she could talk to Sequana if we had her on the same island in the middle of the Seine. Here's the Seine at the beginning, just to give you a sense of just how tiny, tiny it is when it first starts. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Um, uh, that it's just almost like a little creek when it starts. Here is the Seine in front of a champagne domain. I mean, who knew that, that, um, that there is actually a sh champagne domain right on the Seine River? The, the champagne, for those of you who know champagne country, you've got all those fancy, um, Champagne houses in the north, uh, near Epernay or Reims. Uh, and then you've got the poor ones in the south. And this kind of a place is where you want to go if you just want to knock on the door and walk in and not have to worry about 
you know, whether your, your tweed sport coat is the right cut and your Ferragamo shoes are polished uh, well enough. Here's a wonderful guy who runs a champagne domain and um, he not only has a champagne domain, uh, his, his family's been doing it for four generations, but he also um, has what they call a gite, which is kind of like, um, it's kind of like a, a, um, an Airbnb for about 24 people with one kitchen and one bathroom, uh, but it's very reasonable. And it was on his land that I first went swimming on the Seine. Uh, I, yes, I swam in the Seine. Here's the Seine um, as we get close to Paris. My daughter, Gabriella, who on the side is a photographer uh, for fun, took this gorgeous photograph. And I love it because the Seine looks like a mirror and you can see just how slow moving it is. This is the seal of the city of Paris. Uh, there is a motto, Fluctuat Nec Mergitur. I don't know if we can do any contest to see, does anybody in the audience know what Fluctuat Nec Mergitur means? Dead silence, yes, no. Somebody want to push that famous fancy button? Well, I guess we're on. If you know, you could raise your flowing. hand. It's Fluctuat flowing. It was flowing and I'm not sure what Mergitur is. Well, Rhonda, it's Rhonda, right? Yes. Rhonda, that's close enough. T tossed by the waves, but does not sink. I mean, that's not bad. So you're going to get a little prize at the end. You're going to send me your email <laughs> and I'm going to send you a little prize. Because when I do this in real life, I do a contest and I actually give out the little prize if the people, if the audience gets the, gets the answer right. But that, Rhonda, that's pretty good. That's good enough. Thank you. And here... This was um, uh, this is the Eiffel Tower after the terrorist bombings of November of um, 2015, when um, uh, the Bataclan concert hall and several bistros and bars were attacked by uh, terrorists. And so this became the motto after those bombings. You know, we will be tossed by the waves, but we will not sink. Um, Oh, and I have to show you that motto of the. Uh, oh, I can't show you. I'm on the on the. I'm not on the on the on the screen, right? My my slideshow is. Well, I just will show you. I don't know if you can see this. Can anybody? Can you see yeah, this? We can see your small box of you. You see my small box? Okay. Well, you can see that the seal of the city of Paris is even on my Hermes scarf which um, I usually wear and then whip off like a mini striptease, but since it's 95 degrees here, I decided not to do it today. Here's a great picture of a bouquiniste, uh, a bookseller on the Seine. And I put this photograph in for you, Penny, because today we're celebrating books and libraries. Gabriella took this photograph, but it's wonderful because you can still buy these extraordinary old wonderful books on the banks of the Seine. What can you do on the Seine? Well, you can have a lot of fun on the Seine. You can pretend you, you have a beach on the Seine. It's not the, um, it's not the, the Atlantic Ocean in Southampton, but it's not terrible. You can dance salsa on the Seine. You can even take free salsa lessons. And I'll tell you where you can do it for those of you who are gonna be coming to Paris soon, if, if the borders ever open up again between our two countries. You can go fishing on the Seine. You can go boating in hundred year old boats along the Seine. And here is a French Olympic diving diver, a member of the French Olympic team, diving off a diving board, that 12 meter diving board that was constructed to celebrate the uh, Paris, getting the uh, 2024 uh, Olympics and diving into the Seine. I interviewed this kid after when he came out I said, what was it like down there? He said, well, it was kind of dark and I think I might need a shower, but I think after about 20 minute shower, I think I might live. Okay, here's a little bit about romance on the Seine. You asked me why you love Paris. Don't you love Paris because everything is about romance and you know, here's La La Land and you know, in the middle of La La Land, suddenly they go from California and they start dancing along the Seine. Well, um, one of my friends said to me, Elaine, you got all the stuff about romance in the book, but you really need a chapter about sex. And I said, Barbara, there's no sex on the scent. I mean, where would you have sex on the scent? You can't have sex under the bridges. It's really dark. It's dirty. You know, they're, the last time they did kind of like a, 
census of Paris, they discovered there are 2 million Parisians and there are about 4 million Ratatouilles living in Paris. So you really don't want to have sex. But I did, I'm a good investigative reporter, you know, as Penny said, I, as David said, I used to um, cover the CIA. So I found sex on the Seine. And let me, if you would let me uh, just read a tiny little excerpt from the book about One Night Stand, which was uh, um, a fireworks show created by this wonderful Chinese fireworks artist. And who doesn't want a one night stand on the Seine in Paris? So allow me to just read a short excerpt from the book. One night stand opened at midnight with the sounds of sex, heavy breathing, gasping and moaning, broadcast by loudspeaker. Then came rhythmic drumming and a monkey's mating call. Next, fireworks shot into the air. The act lasted 12 minutes, estimated to be the length of time the average French couple needs to climax. That wasn't enough. The artist transformed a bateau mouche into a love boat where 50 couples from around the world had sex inside see-through red tents. The couples could turn on the lights to reveal their silhouettes in motion. To share the bliss with the crowd, the lovers could press a button signaling operators in small boats nearby to send a 15 second spurt of bright white fireworks into the air. One night stand. Okay, now we're gonna have a quiz. Who knows who painted this? Famous Monet. Painting? Monet. Zzz. What's what's this? Was the buzzer sound on Jeopardy? No. Nope. No. Renoir. Who said Renoir? Diana. <laughs> Diana. Diana, come and see me later. You win. That you you okay. got this. Renoir. It's in the Phillips in Washington. Who knows the, who did this one? Matisse. Matisse. Who said Matisse? Rhonda, you can't win twice. This is, uh, we have another, do you have a friend? Do you have somebody else? Good grief. Oh gosh, I'm gonna have to figure out what am I gonna give you? I gotta give, I'll figure out a way to give you two prizes. This is a hard one, but this is the Hamptons. So somebody's gotta know this, no? Okay, does anybody know what this building is? The, anybody know what the bridge is? Does anybody guess? It's the, um... It's the Alexander. It's the Grand Palais. No, no, no. Try again. It's not the Grand Palais. Samaritan. The Samaritan. Who said La Samaritan? Eileen. And Roberta. Eileen, you got it. it. La Samaritan in the back. It's the Pont Neuf, and it's a painting called the Pont Neuf by Albert Marquet. Now, the hardest one is coming up now. Whoops! I guess we skipped the hardest one. But do you? Well, this is a this is a this is a hard one. I'll have to give you. This is a surprise. This is a small replica of the boat that Verrazano sailed to the New World in 1524. He started out with four sailing ships, and the Dauphine uh, made it 50 days later. So there is a there is a New York. Rouen connection with Verrazano. This is a windmill in the middle of nowhere in, um, in uh, uh, nor deep Normandy. Those of you who know Normandy may know a different Normandy, of the Normandy of um, the, um, the, the uh, Debarcament, the D-Day uh, 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 invasion. But uh, this is a 13th century um, windmill that I, I came across one day and I absolutely loved it and I wanted to go in but there were all of these birds around. I mean hundreds of birds hundreds of birds and I dared to walk in and there was this little old guy sitting there and I said hi I'd love to go to the top but there's all these birds and I said did you ever see the birds and he looked at me like ah and I said les oiseaux les oiseaux no I said Alfred Hitchcock and he said oh yeah he said if you don't come down in 20 minutes, I'll come looking for you. But it's a wonderful windmill. Next time you go to Normandy, go and find this windmill. 
Now I showed you the first bridge over the Seine. This is the last bridge over the Seine. This is the bridge that goes from Honfleur all the way to La Havre. It's an absolute stunner of a bridge. It, at the end of the of the, um, the Seine, the estuary is nine miles wide. It's quite extraordinary. But now I'm gonna bring you back to Paris uh, and a wonderful bridge. This is one of my most favorite views of, um, of Paris. I sometimes go to this bridge, the, uh, the La Trunelle Bridge uh, at dawn and I can look at the back of Notre Dame and you can watch the sun uh, come up uh, and, and, and light up the back of Notre Dame. Uh, you know, speaking about Notre Dame, the, um, you know, my book was, was, was written and it was in print when the fire happened on April 15th of last year. It was in what they call, you know, galley form. So it had been sent out to reviewers, sent out to fact checkers. Uh, and um, I happened to have been in New York when the fire broke out. And I was on the phone talking to my husband and he said, Elaine, I have to tell you, I'm looking at a boat in the river and I think the river must have something to do with the fire. It turned out that the infrastructure on the Ile de la Cité where the Notre Dame Cathedral is, uh, was so weak and the water pressure was so weak that there wasn't enough water to put out the fire. So the firefighters of Paris had to go all the way to the Marne River and pull this old tank of a boat, the Ile de France, and to bring it through a lock and through all these curves all the way to Paris. And uh, this, um, this boat, played a huge role in putting out the fire. And with your permission, I'm just going to uh, read the end of the end of the book because what I did was I stopped to the presses and I made the editor, uh, she didn't, I didn't make her, she wanted it and we did it, but we convinced the publisher to uh, add an extra chapter on the fire at Notre Dame. So with your permission, the powerful motors of the Ile de France furiously pump, pumped water from the depths of the river. By the time the fire was extinguished hours later, the city's firefighting force estimated that half the water used in the operation had come from the Seine. General Jean-Claude Gallet, commander of the Sapper Pompier said, that's, that's the firefighting force, we had before us two elements of nature, fire and water. The fire had the face of a demon with a mind of its own. Then, right in front of us, we had the Seine. It was as if the Seine were human. It all sounds a bit mystical, but the water of the Seine saved Notre Dame. His spokesman called it a miracle. I grew up Catholic and I would never dare to contradict those who believe that God answered their prayers in saving Notre Dame. But I also have come to believe in the spiritual as well as the physical power of the Seine. Even before the ancient Romans conquered Gaul, its source had been the site of a temple and a place of pilgrimage dedicated to Sequana, a healing goddess. Notre Dame will be rebuilt as a symbol of hope for the world. It will be reborn as a vibrant place of music, ritual and prayer for believers and a beautiful museum for the masses. The holy waters of the river that once bore the name Sequana saved the greatest cathedral in the world. I want to believe that the spirit of the goddess Sequana herself lives on. And there's the boat pumping water into Notre Dame. And that's it. That's the story. Elaine, I noticed that we have um, we have eleven chats going. Could we take a few minutes for some questions? Oh, please, yes. All right, let me. Um, the other thing is, let's see here. Um, these are oh, these are guesses, and um, for the people who want to ask questions. Could you raise your hands? There's a, there should be a function at the bottom of the screen. Um, 
that there is a question here. Can you swim in the Sen now? You can swim at the at the beginning of the Sen. You know where I was swimming. It was near the city of Troyes. So when the when the river it, before the river gets polluted by humans, either through industry or or barges or pleasure boats, uh, the the river is absolutely pure. But you want to know something interesting that happened with confinement is that because there was no river traffic, the river got much, much cleaner. And in some parts, even in Paris, you could see to the bottom of the river. Well, the, the skies got clearer and the smog disappeared. So I, I yes. suppose that would, would make sense. Um, are there other questions that that we can see. I'm not sure that I'm seeing them, but here, here we have a question. What's it like in Paris now? Um, I don't see Schizoph schizophrenic. It's, it's schizophrenic. It's just today, the city of Paris imposed uh, mandatory masks uh, in certain, on certain streets in, in Paris. I mean, for example, if you were going to walk around on the Rue des Martyrs, my shopping street, you'd have to have a mask. If you would go up to Sacre Coeur uh, uh, at the top of Montmartre, you'd have to wear uh, a mask. Uh, many parts of the Marais, you have to wear a mask. Anywhere along the Seine now, you have to wear a mask. Inside museums, you, you wear masks. Um, but uh, so many people uh, live in outdoors in, in, Fran in Paris and in, in other cities or all over uh, France. And cafe culture is just so important. So you see lots and lots of people sitting in cafes and sitting in restaurants with no masks. So it's a very strange kind of feeling. Also, there are no tourists uh, in Paris because the borders are close to uh, Americans, to Brazilians, to a lot of other countries. Uh, and, and so you can get into the Louvre now uh, without um, much of much of a hassle. I mean, it used to be in normal summers, there are 30 to 40,000 people a day streaming into the Louvre. Uh, th these days, the number is limited to 7,000. So you can see all of your favorite works, um, even the Mona Lisa up close. I mean, I, I went the, the day of the reopening and I had, I was the only person in the room with the mummies. It was just astounding. Mm -hmm. oh. Are most of the museums open at this point? I beg your pardon? Are most of the museums open? Yes, yes, most, most of them are. Uh, well, uh, some museums are not, but uh, by choice, because um, if they're too, if the, if the corridors, if the areas are too, too tiny for people to walk through, um, it can be um, quite difficult. I see there's a question from David. Are you happy with the plan for the Notre Dame restoration? Yes, I'm pretty, I mean, I knew right from the beginning that it was gonna be built exactly the way it was when uh, before the fire, even though that um, the, um, uh, the steeple, the um, uh, um, is only a 19th century creation and uh, it wasn't there uh, originally, but um, it's good enough, it's good enough. And, you know, there can be other manifestations of various designs in, in other places. What do you think, what is the timetable for finishing or, you know, for? It's supposed to be finished, according to the president, it's supposed to be finished five years from the, the time of the fire, but work was really slowed down with confinement uh, and, and nobody is, um, is making any prediction now. I, what will happen is it will open, but some parts of it may still be closed or, or under scaffolding. Another question here. Um, are the Paris Plage set up this summer along the river? Not only are they set up along the river, but you can get COVID-19 testing. Goodness, that's great. Yep, yep. All right, here's a question. Uh, is there any support for Trump among Parisians? Is this- I, I can only, I, I have to use a sample of one. I have <laughs> never met a Parisian who is pro-Trump. I mean, which must have colored their view of Americans in general, is, has it? it? It's 
the, the French are obsessed with politics and they want to talk about American politics. And they, I mean, I, I mean, I find this in France, I find this in any country I've ever traveled in the world. Nobody can accept the electoral college system and believe that America is a democracy. I mean, try explaining the electoral college to Iran, for example, and, and, and the, that this is democracy. Right. All right, we'll keep that one as short well, as it could be. But I uh, have a question. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? My question is, is it possible now for Americans to enter France? I lived in France for a year, but this was 25 years ago. Could I go now or are they keeping Americans out at this point? The only American there are there are exceptions. There are there are uh, uh, several exceptions uh, that Americans can um, that allow some Americans to come into France. For example, if you are a permanent resident of France, you can come in. So if my husband and I decided to go to the United States and we wanted to come back to Paris, uh, we could do that. If you are an essential healthcare worker, you can come into uh, France. If you are a full-time student in American, you can now come into France. But other normal people cannot come into France. I mean, my daughters. What, what, if, what if you're a full-time researcher? N no. What if you're full unless you're doing, researcher? unless you're doing, uh, you can prove that your work is is a, a, a crucial to the future of the world, and you can petition the French through the, your, the consulate and, and the embassy. And I know this because I have been trying like heck to see if I could get my daughters to be able to come back to France. And you know, they, this is their family home for 18 years. And uh, because they're Americans with American residences, they cannot come back. Even people who have, have second homes in, in France cannot come and use their, their, their properties that they own in France. All right, so we're getting a bunch of questions, so we'll kind of try to go through them here a little bit. Uh, can you uh, recommend a few beautiful old towns that you were uh, described? It says in the little Paris bookshop, there were some beautiful old towns described. Are there a few you would recommend visiting? Well, uh, oh, a few, my goodness. Um, well, tomorrow, my husband and I are going to not um, uh, where we have never been, which has a beautiful cathedral, which caught on fire and a beautiful um, uh, 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 chateau and, and museum. Uh, and it's where the Edict of Nantes was, um, was, uh, was, uh, uh, was signed. And it's also, also the only uh, city in France that has a memorial to the memory of French involvement of, in, in slavery. Um, I mean, I have a lot of uh, favorite uh, places in France. I mean, I love uh, Honfleur, which is a wonderful um, city at the end of the Seine, um, uh, opposite La Havre, uh, and you feel like you're entering, um, on some of those streets, you're entering um, the Middle Ages. Um, now, for those who are gonna read the book, you'll get some ideas as well. So do, you know, for, for those who haven't read it, do read it. Let's go, let's, we've got a few other questions. We're gonna skip the one about Iran, just a minute, David. So that we, <laughs> at, we got a few France related questions. When are schools reopening in France? Schools are going to be reopening. I mean, they've already, they're already starting to reopen um, some schools. They haven't, there's no uniform rule for how they're going to reopen, who's, what kids have to wear masks, how much, um, uh, kids are going to be in, in classrooms, whether it's going to be some virtual and some not. It's really a patchwork and there is not a, a national consensus about what to do uh, with, um, with schools. And there's a lot of pushback by teachers uh, in France as there is um, in the United States. Okay, sounds like a situation. Um, so but what you have to realize, but what, there is one thing I must say though, there's a huge difference between the the virus here in France and the virus in the United States, and um, the way it spread. I mean, when the virus, when we had confinement, confinement, uh, in mid March, what that meant is that my husband and I were not allowed to go out. No French person was allowed to go out on the street for more than one hour 
uh, and no more than one kilometer away from his or her home. And the only way you could go out is if you, if you had a signed certificate um, with your name, address, uh, and the purpose of, of your trip outside the house. So it had to be an, an urgent reason, like buying groceries, going to the drugstore, visiting a doctor, uh, going to a court. Uh, and if you violated that restriction, you, you, were, you were stopped by police and you were fined. Uh, and this, okay. this, this very draconian um, lockdown really did help stop the, the spread of the virus. Okay. Um, someone asked what you were working on. This minute? No, next. Oh. Is there a project? Ac well, I, I, I'm actually thinking right now about my next book, but I actually just, oh, somebody was asking about, you know, small towns. I just finished a story that will appear um, probably in September, October in Smithsonian Magazine on um, the chateau of, an, of a French paint, 19th century painter named Rosa Bonheur. Uh, and her most famous painting is sitting in the Metropolitan Museum. It had been bought by Cornelius Vanderbilt and, it, and he bought it for so much and he gave it to the Met and he bought it for so much money that she was able to buy this wonderful chateau. And her atelier and, and study rooms have been preserved the way they were when she was the most famous uh, uh, female artist in, in France and uh, it's all being restored and it's op opening as a museum. And, and I, I just had a blast doing this. We're just reporting the story. Um, someone asks, what, what is your favorite area or town in France? Oh, that is an impossible question. And over a good glass of wine, we will discuss 10 of my favorite towns, but you're gonna to have to, whoever asked the question is gonna to have to come into my living room and sit here and we will talk about everything from, you know, Lyon to La Rochelle to um, Châtillon to Rouen and places in between. Someone wanted a, a clarification about the artist, the artist that you just mentioned. Rosa Bonheur. Bonheur, Bonheur, like the the French word for um, for happiness. Rosa Bonheur, B O N H E U R, mm -hmm. and she was a painter of animals. And she painted this. Anybody who really knows the Met and knows the 19th century um, uh, section will will re remember this enormous painting of of horses. Um, it's called the Horse Fair, uh, and uh, it's probably her most famous painting. All right, we're closing in on our time here. So quickly, do you ever go back to your old neighborhood around the Rue du Bac? Yes. Once in a while, but you know something? I've really come to love the new neighborhood. It's, it's, it's much more what we call popular or, or popular in the sense that it's um, not as hoity-toity. Um, and uh, it's kind of like the difference in the old days between the east side and the west side. And I just feel more comfortable uh, being in a neighborhood where I know all the merchants by name, they know me, and um, that every time I go out on the street, it's, a, it's an adventure. That's great. That's great. Elaine, I have to ask you before we finish, I mean, reading this book, what strikes me not only is how much information you have managed to accumulate and convey so beautifully, but how many people whose paths uh, you crossed and who, who you learned about, it's, it's really stunning uh, to think of all the new friends you made and the associations you made. What has that been like? You must have a, a, a huge raft of new friends that you've made while writing this book. Well, it's a lot more fun interviewing real people about their lives than, for example, when I had to cover the State Department and I was covering the corridors. I, I always like to say I, I love covering the streets, not the corridors. And so to interview a barge woman, you know, a woman who spent her whole life on a, on, on a barge, uh, it's a life apart uh, <clears throat> and how hard that life was. It, it was quite extraordinary or to walk along the Seine uh, with Darius Konji, who was the uh, 
the cameraman for the movie Midnight in Paris and, and see the Seine through his eyes. I mean, that's what's so much fun about being a reporter. And, and even though I'm writing books, I am always, uh, I was, and I always will be a street reporter. Right, well, Elaine, I'm gonna look up for those of you who, who may not have seen what it looks like. Um, someone asked if it's out in hardcover. Yes, it's in hardcover. And you can go to the bookstores, which are open out here, book, uh, Southampton Books or uh, Caneos. I love Caneos. And it's wonderful to patronize these small bookstores. And uh, it would make a, a wonderful gift for um, so many people interested in history, interested in geography or people or, so, you know, it is, it, it, it was a wonderful book to read, Elaine. And the best thing is that it put us in touch with you and we've, had a lovely visit and we would love it if you would come back and talk to us again about other- I'm there, I'm there. but before we end, I have to, first of all, I have to tell, first of all, I have to thank you, Penny, for organizing this event and for uh, just, you know, your generosity of spirit, which uh, really, um, uh, you know, I can't wait to be part of the library community and 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 see it up, up close. Um, but I also have to show you what the prize is for those who, um, who won. And, and whoever won should send me an email, elaine.chalino at gmail.com. It's also on my website. Uh, and this is an illustrated map of the, of the Seine in Paris done by a friend of mine, Carol Gillot. And she, she's a professional artist in, in Paris. And I will send you... Um, uh, a, a link that will give you a copy that you can print up and uh, it's a frame ready frame ready copy uh, so that you can um, have a little bit of the send. Oh, and the send, the book is coming out in paperback next month. This is very exciting. Someone mentioned that they tried to order it on Amazon. It was delayed until October. Well, but August, uh, September 29th is the, is the, they just moved the pub date to September 29th for the, uh, the paperback uh, and there's going to be a surprise about it that I can't talk about but we are excited that there is going to be a paperback and you know travel books are much easier to buy in paperback because it's hard to carry around this big thing. Well someone asked for the title again and it's the Sen, Sen. The River That Made Paris and uh, Joanna who's our social media person has just posted that this talk that you have just heard is now available on YouTube. And so you can click on to the, if you go into the chat room there, you can click on that link, you can tell your friends about it. Uh, Elaine, I can't thank you enough for uh, having made, and by the way, it's 11 o'clock where you are. So you, yeah. stayed, you stayed up late for, for us and I hope it was worth it for you because it was really wonderful for us, all of us, Thank you to David Alperin for uh, being the person who ha helped m make this come about. And, and Elaine, thank you for everything you've done for us. Well, thank you. And I can't wait to, to be at the library. I'm a big promoter of libraries. I have my own library here that I've created all around me since we've come to Paris. And um, uh, I wanna have a private tour of the Southampton. You will have a private tour. And we will look forward to, to future visits with you. Thank you so much. Hope Thank we'll you. see all of you again. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank Beautiful. you, David. <laughs> Bye, Pleasure. Alessandra and Gabriella.